upside down. <laughs> 77 with six kids, them lips ain't the same. Them lips hang like an old turtleneck. <laughs> I came in one time, my mama pussy was on the floor. <laughs>
No, I, 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 it, to me, COVID did not stifle a lot of creativity. I think it, it was just the opposite. I think it spawned a lot of creativity because you, you, a lot of people, you know, came up because of, especially black people, because, you know, when, when, when our backs are against the wall, you got to come out. You're either going to sink or swim. If you didn't survive creatively during COVID, you're just lazy as, you're just lazy as fuck. Because I end up doing cooking shows, I end up uh, being able to work on my documentary. Uh, it spawned. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, the the verses, the verses kind of came out of the whole. That's right. Uh, the, the, yeah. of that you look at my man D Nice, but Club Quarantine. I mean, a lot of people got way more creative. It 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 made, to me COVID was God saying to everybody at one time, okay, all this shit you've been saying you wanted to do and didn't have time to do or I don't have time to work on this or do this you all had time you all had time 100%. everybody at the same time had the same time to do whatever thing you've been crying about you ain't got time to do so if you didn't get it done that's on your ass because you had time to do it and some people I hate that businesses failed I hate that you know people died we lost you know family members we lost we lost friends we lost co-workers people lost businesses but that was God saying to you at one time, grow, mm. be creative. That's you know what I'm good. saying? Do something with that time. If you didn't grow, it, it, that's your fault. Yeah. And that's something I've always respected about you, guy. You're always growing, man. You're not even, not just. Well, not, with, not, not vertical. Though. Well, okay. yeah, we're going to work on that. Five, seven. <laughs> we're going to work on that. But, you know, what, what you mentioned to me is that you just got back from a a a kind of a, a retreat. Tell me about this retreat, man. This oh work retreat. Yeah, I went to Idlewild, Michigan, man, which is a historic place um, that where black people used to go and vacation. Like two white people created this 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 resort right outside of um, Grand Rapids for black people to go and and vacation because we had no places to go because you know, back, it, this is the early 1900s. So I went there because a friend of mine has a lake house there and I rented the lake house to go work, to get away from LA, get away from the distractions, the cigar lounges, the liquor stores, the, the bars, the, the leeches, the, 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 the holes, uh, the, the, you know, and everything. And so I can just go write and create and work on new projects, new TV shows, work on my new act and things like that. And you need that sometimes. You need to just go on a retreat. And I've been wanting to do it for years and kind of you get busy and lost in the shuffle, but I know how focused I was during COVID when I couldn't do anything. And I wanted that focus again. And then watching, you know, Kanye's Genius um, documentary, which reminded me like, man, when he was in Montana or whatever he was, but he was off somewhere off the grid. And sometimes you need to do that. Go off the grid with your crew and just create. Right. And you, it's called a worker's retreat, but yeah. really it's a way to deep, deep, deep right. plug from everything. I wasn't on there on vacation. Yeah. I was not there on vacation. I was not there to relax. I was there to grind. I mean, of course, you got to find your moments and take brain breaks and, and, and get in there. But there was nothing there. It was like, like one restaurant, a bar, which nobody went to. Right. And that's what I needed. I needed no nightlife. I needed no distractions. The only distraction was these goddamn caterpillars. It was caterpillar season and they invaded the damn uh, resort area, man, like thousands of them. That's crazy. Thousands of them. And they were like, you know, silkworms. So you're walking and then they'll just be swinging. Like, wow. like I know I ate about three of them. I know I, I know because you're walking and talking and the next thing you know, you know, you're swallowing like you're swallowing a, a, a worm and a tequila. Good protein, man. Good protein mm -hmm. guy. But that's crazy, Yeah, they would just start wiggling down your little throat, man. <laughs> but, but other than that, man, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to do that maybe every, it'd be great to do that every quarter. Just every to recharge the battery. Yeah, bro. recharge the battery, yeah. go create and, and uh, yeah. because I'm, insp I'm inspired. I'm inspired by the success of the documentary to go out and create more because people love those stories and, and the Fat Tuesday brand is expanding. So, yeah. Oh, man, the, it's, it's. It, it was really well done. It paces really well. It tells the story. It, you know, it's it, and the music you guys used brought you back to that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was that really was well a, done. That was a Reggie Hudlin, you know, one of the greatest producers, directors, 
on every medium. Uh, I mean, he was, just, he was just great at doing that. And then he had Marcus Miller, who's a great jazz musician, musician, period, who scored it. It was just everything coming, aligning at the same time. Amazon was a great, you know, studio partner. Kelsey Grammer, Gramnet, that whole team over there was great. And Original Productions, right. who, who did the services on it as well, man. It was just a great, it was like an Ice Turner glove, you know? Not, not, one of, not an OJ glove, because <laughs> this glove fit. Right. <laughs> and we came together and formed Voltron, man, and, and, and put a nice piece of, piece of um, you know, no, it's, story it's, out there. No, it's great. And everyone I've talked to that's watched it, I, I you know, thank you again for inviting us over to the, the, watch the watching part. party. That was a lot of fun, man. But, you know, the, 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 thing, the thing now is you, the, the political correct world we live in meets the feelings of the viewers they get feel some type of way and now you're seeing even a guy like will smith smack a chris rock right. you're seeing dave bullshit. Chappelle get tackled on stage right has that happened to you oh yeah yeah not tackled but i had people approach the stage yeah yeah when, when, when mitt romney was running for president and i was going in on mitt and some good old boys tried to rush the stage in pittsburgh but i had some pittsburgh stillers there who's like look you ain't touching nothing. I had a, a, a white lady throw some water on me on stage. What trust she missed? Missed me, bitch. Um, <laughs> Cause I was talking about Mitt Romney. I think that was in Dayton, Ohio. So I mean, there, there's people who get upset. I, I, I ruffle feathers sometimes. I have, I have right. no problem with that. You come to a comedy show. It's a comedy show. Right. Leave your f personal feelings outside. Hundred percent. And and and, uh, but as far as like, who rushing the stage? They don't try that shit, y'all. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I don't try that shit. I mean, Will Smith, one of my favorite actors, you know, Chris Rock, one of my favorite comedians, man. But Will was wrong. He know he was wrong. Uh, and it, it was it was foul. It, it, and I, he, Chris Rock is way more classier than me. Because I, 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 I would have disrupted the whole goddamn Oscars. He played it pretty with, cool. With, he played, he? man, what a classy guy. And, yeah. and, 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 and Will ain't no punk. Will, ain't, Will from the streets, don't let this... Don't let don't let all the good guy stuff fool you. He ain't no punk. So he know he know if it was reversed, he would have he would have he would have whooped some ass too. So, you know, this ain't saying nothing that I'm not anti Will Smith. I'm anti what he did. Right. You know, but he was wrong and and you know I don't I, I don't get down like that. It's when like, you and I, I you were like the first guy I shot a call to, I said, was that fake? No, I some people I thought it was staged. Fake. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't staged. Man. But you knew off the rip it was I, a real. I, it, it disturbed the hell out of me because two of our, especially being black, and one of our one of the greatest actors of our generation, one of the greatest comedians of my generation, uh, and Will Packer, who produced it, who who executive produced the Oscars, you know, seeing his light being dimmed a little bit because I knew him when he was a cable puller on a movie I did called Ride back in '97. And to see him go from there to exec producing the biggest award show for film and to have that happen on his watch was like, come on, right, come yeah. on, brothers. That you, was gotta, another... you gotta be better than that, man. You 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 gotta do you got you gotta, you know, and, and and I think it was a lot of underlying stuff going on with that whole Will Smith thing. It that that um it was just wrong. Yeah. Period. And he knows it. 100%. Everybody knows it. You know, guy, it's funny because a lot of people think, oh, you know, guy, guy got to ride the coattails of his brother, and he just woke up one day and was this this high level comedian. Yeah, people think I started on third base. They think you started on third. What they don't realize is just like that guy started as a cable puller. You were a PA in town, man. Man, before then, I was an extra. I started in the minor leagues. I didn't start on third base. I started in the minor leagues. I mean, I first moved to LA. I was grinding. I was a marketing assistant for a movie called Zebrahead. Um, Oliver Stone produced the film with uh, Nabushe Wright and, and uh, Michael, pa Michael Rappaport. Um, and, and then from then on, I started doing extra work, you know, background work. After that, man, was just a PA on a Martin show while I was delivering scripts, but always, you know, grinding, always being a sponge, man. And then when the opportunity came to write a script, you know, Martin and them allowed me to write a script that was, got produced. It was one of the funniest episodes. And, uh... After that, man, I started acting. Had a, had a decision to make. Do I want to be, you know, do I want to quit my job as a production assistant, you know, a gopher, guys who are delivering scripts and running errands, 
to taking comedy serious and going full time with it. And that was a first leap of faith. Other than moving to LA, that was the first leap of faith I took. It was like, you know what, I'm gonna I'm quit this guarantee money and go out here and, and, and try these jokes. I bet on me. And, and the bet paid off, man, because now you're producing number one documentaries and your acting career is on fire, your comedy career. Do you think everyone should start off in improv if they want to crack into the acting world? Is that important? Everybody has a different route. You know, my route was my route. Your route is your route. Um, you do what you feel necessary to do. I mean, learn all the tools, of course. I mean, it depends on what you want to do. But learn all, learn everything. Because in this day and age with technology, you can do everything. And you, ain't, you don't have to wait on anybody. You know, I get, I get asked all the time in, in different cities by young actors or directors or comedians and writers, like, how can I get put on? How can I? And you really don't have to move to LA to do that in the beginning, if you can't afford to. If you can afford to, do it. But I tell people, you know, if you want to be a writer, right? And you wanna, you need a reel. You need something, a sample to show people what you're, what you do. So I tell people all the time, if you want to be a writer, okay, find someone who wants to be an actor in your little town. Then find somebody who wants to be a director. Mm. And find somebody who wants to be a DP, a, a, a director of photography. You want to shoot. Find someone who wants to edit. Sign, find someone who wants to score. All y'all get together, and put on a project. That way, the writer has something for their reel. The actor, something for their reel, the director, the editor, the cinematographer, the uh, score. Now you all have a piece of something you can show, like, this is what I do. I wrote that, or I acted in this. There's, there's, you don't have to be in Hollywood or New York to go do that shit. You got phones now, you can re shoot a whole movie on that shit. Shoot a short. Just find somebody in your little town, you all get together, and put a project together. That may be the biggest gem you've dropped. Just create your own team. Create your own create And everybody, your own magic. Every, every hand washes it the other. Exactly. Yeah. Now I all y'all got something for your reel. No I, one, you got everybody, is, all the bases are covered. You're good. Right. So quit waiting on that phone to ring or quit waiting on somebody to give you shit. That little phone you got right now is all you need. And, and put your team together. Isn't that crazy? We, have, we literally have a studio in our pocket. Yes. Now. It's insane. Yes, I do all my own social media and, and, and stuff. I can score it right on. You know, you got somebody in, in you got somebody in, in a town who just do beats, right? Get a beat from them and tell them their beat is gonna be in their production. You got somebody who, 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 who wants to be that director who call the shots. Find those people. Right. Y'all get together, boom, that's your calling card. Right. You know, you talked about acting, I, you know, in my top, say 25 films the, one of the films is history of american x american history x american history x he a little dyslexic y'all <laughs> be patient <laughs> he grew he went to public school <laughs> he uh i watched you hang with ed norton man in, in a pivotal scene the movie touched on so many different things and we don't need to get into that but how was it working with Ed Norton? Did your game rise to the occasion? Or talk about that moment in time. A lot of people may not remember that film. It's a classic must-see yeah. film. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it, I learned a lot from working with Ed. I learned some good, I learned some bad. Uh, I learned that Ed is very passionate about what he does. And he's great, not good. He's great at what he does. Uh, I learned, you know, how to do film uh, by working with Ed, learning, you know, lenses and camera angles and um, um, the shot shots and things like that. I learned, you know, the method. You know, he's a very good, great method actor as well. So I learned a lot. Um, the bad, a little bit of bad, but that that is it, 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 that comes with wanting him wanting to the best project. He may not go away about it the best way, but his intentions are pure. A little bit of a dick kind of on set? Um, just, just, I wouldn't say a dick. I would say, I mean, you, you get nominated for an, an Oscar in your first project. Your dick's yeah. gonna grow a little bit. Sure, you know? no, I understand. And being trained the way he was trained, it's real, you're gonna have yeah. a bit of a, you sure. know, you know, you coming in, like the Straight Outta Compton video, you know, boom, you busting in, 
through the door like that, you, your balls are huge. Right. So, and being young, a young actor sure. at the time no, in the you. game. I'm reading between the lines. Then, yeah. Then, yeah. So, I mean, um, that would do any, that would have anybody feeling a certain type of way. But what God has done for me is he made me self-aware. So when I, when I'm being a dick, you know, my other side, like, come on now, you know, that's not you, you know, bring it down a little bit. All right, bring it down. I have to tell my, I have to talk myself a lot. That's why I say I'm tripolar. Because <laughs> I, I, I got that, I got that ego side. I got that narcissist side. But we I also do. have that self-awareness as well. And then I got that, that God that, that balances everything out. So I know when to, when, when, when to say when and when not to say when. Right. But, but working with Ed Norton was amazing. Working with the director, Tony K was, was amazing because he gave me a green light. And when a director trusts you, and tell you to, you can take this character wherever you want to. That is an actor's dream, especially for a comedian, because we, you know, we're, we're creatives anyway, and we write, so we want to be controlled anyway. We're control freaks. Right. Most comedians are control freaks, so to get that type of, of liberty and freedom from a director, and you working with Ed Norton, like, he's going to make you raise your game. Yeah. Trust and believe he's going he's gonna to make you raise your game. A hundred percent. Now, did did you feel the same way when you worked on the set of Pearl Harbor? Was that a was, was that experience similar or a little different? Because now no, you're a little was, bit more working on Pearl Harbor was similar, man. Because you know Michael Bay was just like you know, hey, you know, he, he, he'd worked with Martin on Bad Boys and those things, so he knows to give a comedian, you know, just step back a little bit, you know, and let him go. As long as you respect the script and respect the story and respect the scene and respect the period. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, it was a period piece. Sure. You know, Pearl Harbor didn't happen in the- They didn't millennium. have slang words that we use today. Exactly. And- Just like the movie Life. You have to respect the period that that movie is shot in when you're gonna ad lib. Right. When, you, when, when a director gives you that trust or the actor gives you that trust, um, you have to, you, you have to you have to do right by it. So Pearl Harbor was 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 great with Cuba Gooden, who was you know an Oscar winner, and then Michael Bay, and I Does mean, it, come where on. Where do you go from there, man? I mean, my scenes weren't with you know the other actors, Josh Hartnett and Ben Affleck. I didn't have really any scenes with them, uh, but with Ed Nor- I mean, with um, Cuba Gooden Jr. You know, our scenes was direct, and he was such a gracious actor as well. You know, can, can, he was giving me like, man, be funny if you say this, but in a, in a, in a good way. Right. You know, like encouraging he didn't mind you, meeting yeah. the buzz of the joke and things like that. So he, it was good. What was your favorite uh, acting experience? What was, if you look back, what was your favorite? The movie Life. Yeah. That's the a movie huge, Life. I Eddie mean, Murphy, Martin Lawrence, two, two of the guys who inspired me to do stand up alone. My brother, but he wasn't in it. But Bernie Mac, what yeah. a cast. Come on, man! How, that, that how'd movie. you feel on that ride? Like, did you have I your no? I felt like pet? a young Kobe playing with Jordan and Shaq. That's a great way of putting it. You know, I'm 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 the young gun coming in. I admire y'all, but I got some shit too. You know, and and, and being, you ha- it, it's a weird it's a weird thing because you are in awe of working with two three icons like that. Then you throw Anthony Anderson in there as well. I mean, who was another, you know, great actor, and Miguel Nunez. You, you throw them in there, and then at the same time, you're like, oh, man. But at the same time, you can't be a fan at that moment when it comes to your role. You can be a fan when they say cut. But when you're in that scene, you know, that's why Kobe used to say and Jordan used to say when they played, the teammates just stood in there and just watch them. No, motherfucker, you in the play. Right. It, it, forget that I'm Michael Jordan. You, you got to you, You're on the team right now. I need you. And that's how you got to be in the scenes. Yeah. You got to be in the scene. You got to be, you know, they, they need you. Right. You need them and, and, and you all are feeding out of each other. So that energy is important. You can't yeah. be in fan mode when you're in the scene. Right. And GT, when we hang out socially and I see you in social settings, you're funny, man. You're you're roasting people. You're, we're, we're having a great time. But I'm, I'm, ass, I'm, a, I'm a professional asshole. I'm a bleached asshole. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm an asshole, but I'm at least it's bleached. Not my, my, my real asshole, I'm just saying. <laughs> like, if you're into porn, then, you know, you see a bleached asshole. You mean, it's just an asshole, but at least, at least it's bleached. <laughs> you got the little Ohio State Buckeye in your room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm cracking up because you and I have had some great fun hanging out, man. And But a lot of comedians that I've met, Guy, 
they um, they're boring in person, man. They're not funny. They're not on. And I don't expect everyone to be on all the time, but they're just like, well, you know what I'm saying? Well, here's uh, the thing. It's not their job to make you laugh right. if they're not on stage. Correct. Their job is to make you laugh when they're on stage. Got you. But a lot of comedians, man, we're dark, twisted, fucked up individuals on the inside. Not all, but most of us come from a dark place. We do stand up to veil the that hurt, that yeah. darkness, that pain. Let's go back to Will Smith. So Will Smith, if you read his book, really good book, you see he grew up, he grew up with a lot of trauma. And this is my own humble opinion, so I'm not a doctor, I haven't talked to Will about this, in my own observation, that we all have opinions, and this is my very humble opinion, it's like, Will ain't no punk. Will grew up with a lot of trauma and a lot of pain. And how we deal with that is being funny and being goofy and cracking jokes. And that's, and, and Will's not a comedian. He could have done stand-up and been very well at it, but he chose to do his comedy in his roles. So the, the, the jokes and his comic timing, comedic timing and the goofiness comes from masking, in my right. opinion, that pain, like, we, like comedians do. So when you look at the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, that's that mask. But if you look at the new show, Bel-Air, that's who Will, Will Smith probably really is more like. Right. Is that guy than the Fresh Prince of Bel Air? Oh, 100%. Will, uh, uh, um, Will. So it's like you can only pretend for so long. Right. I got and, you. And pretty soon it's like, okay, motherfuckers think I'm soft. You know, he chose that moment to, you know, which I thought was a wrong moment sure. to choose and the wrong person. Um, he chose that moment to say, hey, look, this is who I really fucking am. And, but, but it was that masking that he was doing, and that's what makes him, you know, a great actor, is when he does the, the serious scenes, the dramas, he's able to pull from that darkness. Right. When he does the comedy, he's pulling from that veil. With me, in American History X, and a lot of the dramatic roles that I do, I'm able to tap into that dark side. And it, I tell comedians all the time, if, if, if you get rid of your comedy ego, and you tap into that dark side, we make some tr great dramatic actors. But our muscle is to make everything funny. You have to throw it out the window and be vulnerable, not being funny, and play that character true. Mm. Play the truth of that character right. and quit trying to look for the joke and play the honesty and the pain in that character. And we'll do well as, comedic as dramatic actors you know, who are comedians. You know, that, that's some eye-opening perspective, Guy. You know, you, you mentioned the word comic and comedian. What's the difference between uh, a comic and a comedian? And this is not my definition. I heard it, so I won't take credit for this. But a comic says funny things. A comedian makes things funny. So if you look at a comedian, a comic like Carrot Top, okay. this is no knock on Carrot Top, that's what he was. He, was. he used props. He was a comic. You never knew who he was. He didn't let you inside. He wasn't vulnerable. He wasn't transparent. And, and comics are great. It's great to be a comic, but it's also great to be a comedian. It's great to be both if you can. So comedians let you in. Comedians will show you that pain. Even though they're veiling it, they will show you that pain. And a comic would just set up punch, set up punch, set up punch. You don't know them. Did you like the production? behind the camera creative side of the business. Is that something you're interested in doing more or was? The behind the scenes production is interesting to me because that's why I basically started, you know? And being a comedian, which we are control freaks, and being behind the scenes, you're in control of a lot of shit. So that definitely interests me. But also just being able to put all the pieces together, you know? and seeing it come to life, but, but connecting. I'm a connector, meaning that I like connecting people, you know, and, and you don't owe me anything. So as that connector, I like connecting the different departments and having it all come together. When I'm with you, everyone walks up to you and goes, Guy, why don't you do a Netflix special? Guy, why don't you do a podcast? And what is the answer 
so we could shut everybody up on those two questions. Well, I'm, I'm, gl I, I'm glad when people come up and ask me about specials and other projects. I mean, I did something interesting and they want more. Mm. It's a good thing. I don't ever get tired of that question. And it's really up to me. I control uh, my destiny. And I, I want to do a special when I know it's right. I'm a perfectionist to a fault. There's a lot of specials out there. Specials aren't even fucking special anymore. You know, there, there, there's so many out there. So right. until I feel like I have something to say, which I know I do now, that's when I'll take, you know, doing a special more serious and focused. I don't want to be on TV just to be on TV. Right. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm, if I'm, if I'm going to be on TV, I want to make it count. How, how long is a typical Netflix comedy special? Is it 40 minutes? It's 30 to to, a, to a usually 50 minutes, okay. 55 minutes. So that's usually, if, you know, the thing. If that's the format, how much writing do you have to do to create a 30? Everybody's different. Okay. Everybody's different. It, it's, there's no amount of writing that I can say. I would say this. You need a solid hour and a half, two hours okay, to, to do, do a 30-minute special. That's a lot, right? You need about a solid three hours, in my opinion, four hours to do an hour special. Because once you're done with that material, it's gone. And you have to go back on the road. So even if the, the other hours aren't developed as well, but if, as long as it's developed enough for you to go back out and not do that same hour you did on the special and, do the, and, do, and, and now work on that material for your next special. Like I, I have a lot of comedians, young comedians who wanna go on the road to open for me. Right? And usually an opening act does anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. Right? Wow. And uh, at that time, I'm like, oh, I got, a, I, got, I got a strong 15 minutes, I got a strong 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay, well, let's break this down. First of all, you got to know who you're trying to open for. I have a very diverse audience in most cities. My audience is usually 40 to 50, sometimes 60% white, unless I'm in Atlanta. Baltimore, Detroit, Houston, <laughs> Memphis. Houston is pretty, pretty mixed too. But unless those cities, so in those cities that I'm playing and you're a black comic, um, you have to be able to play to the other audience as well, white people. Let's just call it what it is, you know. Um, do you have the material that will cross over into that, to that audience? Because your job as an opener is to set the table for me, okay? So I tell them, you need at least an hour, a solid hour. But I'm only doing 15 minutes. You need a solid hour. I'll tell you why you need a solid hour. Yes, you're only doing 15 minutes. But how much of that 15 minutes or that, or that hour can cross over into my audience? What if I tell you to work clean? I don't want you to be dirty because I'm dirty. Can you take the dirty jokes out and still have a solid 15 minutes. What if I tell you don't do any political stuff? Can you take the political stuff out and still have a solid 15 minutes? What if I tell you don't do, don't do anything about relationships, marriage or divorce? Can you take, if that's in your act, can you take that out? What if I tell you no crowd work? I do crowd work, don't do crowd work. You gotta take that out your act. You may not be left with shit. Now, a lot of comedians won't tell a comedian that I used to for the first 27 years of my career, I would never tell uh, an opening act what they could and could not do. I feel like if I'm a headliner, then I should be able to follow anything. But there's certain times you want to work on certain bits. And if I want to work on a political bit this weekend, I don't want you doing your political stuff. Right. And so you got to be able to, to take all of this stuff out of your act and still have an effective, strong 15 minutes that's going to set the table for me in an audience that's mixed. Wow. And... You know, you have to know your crowd. So, it, 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 and then they, you gotta realize the openers don't get paid a lot on the road. Can you afford to even open for me? The comedy clubs don't pay the openers that much money at all. Most, most of them don't fly you in and won't put you up. Wow. And out of the money that you make, can you, get can you afford plane tickets, especially now? Can you afford your hotel room? And then when you're done with all that, can you afford to pay your rent when you get back to LA? It's a lot that goes into it. It sounds cute. Oh, I'm on the road opening for Guy Torrey. I'm on the road opening for Tony Rock. It sounds cute, 
when you go back and you want to stretch your chest in front of the other comedians that, oh, I just got off the road. It sounds cute, but let's, let's unpack it and see what it really entails. If you really love this shit, then, then, you, then you'll, you'll know, you'll, you'll work on all of that. You'll get you a buddy pass to try to fight for free. You'll get your hotel hookup yeah. to try to get you a discount on a hotel room. And, and you'll work on getting a solid hour so you can do 15 minutes. That's the type of passion and dedication needed to make it. And thank you for unpacking that for us. I, I've asked you this before. I got to ask you this again on air. Your Mount Rushmore, your top five. I'm not answering that. Come on, guy. I need it. I need it Mount today. I need your I'm Mount not. Rushmore, baby. Every comedian that ever walked this earth. Give me your Mount Rushmore, guy. I'm telling guy. you, no. I'm not going to do it because it's too many. I'm, I'm, my style is, is, is a gumbo. It's a, it's a, 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 a smorgasbord. Of yeah. It's, 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 a, it's a pot of gumbo. You know, I, I, I like physical comedy. I like political satire. I like X-rated material. I like uh, uh, self-deprecation. I love all of it. And if you see my show, you'll see all of that. I have all of those elements. All of those elements. Here's an interesting thing. I interviewed a rapper. He said he doesn't like to listen to other rap music because he doesn't want to be influenced. And that can happen in stand-up. You can listen to other comedians and be influenced, so you have to really be careful how you listen. Because you've got to study the craft. You have to... St I tell young comedians, whoever make you laugh the most, that's where your sensibility is. That's who you study because you kind of have their... Their, their, their point of view and their sense of humor. That's interesting, yeah. So, so if that person makes you laugh the most, that's who you, that's who you kind of, you know, boom. And you're gonna, you're gonna naturally pick up their mannerisms and their tone and their cadence because you're looking at them so much. But after a while, Dio Hughley told me this long time ago, I was doing comedy eight months, and he was showing Bermuda. And I was nervous as shit. And I just happened to have a conversation with D.L. because he was the headliner. And he was just about stand-up. Like, he said, it's funny how when you start doing stand-up, you try to be everybody but yourself. And then after a while, when you get the hang of it, you're like, damn, I was just funny being me. And it's so true. Because when you're around your buddies in school and home and family, you're funny as hell. But the minute you get on stage, you're trying to be somebody, you're trying to be somebody else. But what happened to the person that that inspired you to do stand-up who you were yourself, you have to bring that into the fold. So you have to, you have to, you have to, you have to eventually get back to you. God, it's a mind fuck, God. It's a mind fuck. It's a, it, <laughs> you it, gotta that's be. Why, and, and we're so, we're, we're such a disrespected art. You know, there's a tier of comedians that, yo, yeah, they're the greatest. Yeah, fine. But for all the other people who, 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 who ain't the household names, you still need to respect this craft like you do music and acting. 100%. It's like we're 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 always an afterthought. Why why do you say you're a disrespected art? Because most because people because we're afterthought. When you're in this game, oh, the comedian, oh, that's, you, I'm, they feel like they can treat a comedian any type of way, or say you know to you any. No one no one walks up to rappers and say, man, spit some bars. No one walks up to actors and say, hey, man, do that scene. And 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 the other thing is when you're in relationships, doing stand up. Your spouse, whether it be male or female, because a lot of funny females out there, your spouse is jealous because if you're a female, you hang around all the guys. If you're a female, your spouse is jealous because it looks like we're, we're having fun. It looks like we're on stage having fun. It's a mind fuck. It's an art. It's not just being an asshole and cracking jokes. It's fucking work. You have no idea what's going on in our brains when we're on stage. It looks, we make it look fun. We make it look easy. Or if, if we're going to a comedy club to hang out, and we're not on stage tonight. Well, why are you going? You're not on stage tonight. Why are you going? Because that's the office. You go to work sometimes and don't fucking work. So don't, don't question me why I'm going to the comic club that night. And because sometimes you need to be around it to be inspired, you know, to, 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 to soak it all in. And I say we're disrespected because sometimes you don't get everything you should just get naturally. They think they can treat you any type of way because you're a clown, you're a buffoon. You're, oh, you're coming. He's funny. He's no nah, man. We're artists. We're, we're healers. We're doctors. We're philosophers. We're dads. We're mothers. We're uncles. We're sons. We're all of that. So give us the same respect you give these other these other arts, these other crafts. Right. 
And laughter is like the chicken soup for the soul, man. It makes people laughter just... Laughter purifies the air. It purifies the air, man. And Because here's the thing. It means you need somebody to replace something. You go get a comedian. That's why we're on radio. That's why we host game shows. Oh, yeah. That's why we co-host talk shows. Because that dead air don't ha doesn't happen with comedians. Because we're always on. We're always on until we do a joke that you don't fucking like. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you want to cancel us. Right. Man, go on with that bullshit. I was going to ask you. Go on with that bullshit yeah. cancel culture. Because you laugh at us for, for years at our careers. Our whole career, you're laughing with one joke that you don't like. Now, all of a sudden, cancel everything they've ever done. Cancel their families and how they feed their families. Cancel the, 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 the charity organizations they brought money to. Cancel everything over one little punk ass joke that you didn't like. Wherever it is, it don't matter what, what the joke was, it's like, if you don't like that joke, you don't like that joke. But don't try to cancel a whole person because they said one thing you didn't fucking like. Would you man, think, go fuck yourself. What would you think of that guy Kramer from Seinfeld, man? Remember that controversy? Oh, yeah. He said, nigga. He said, now, that, that, that was... Did that, that was offend some, you? Fuck yeah. But you also give him the comedy pass, right? Or no? No. No. I don't okay. give nobody who ain't black the, 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 the pass to say nigga. So he... You ain't black, you, you said... So he's X'd out. Basically. Hey, I mean, was he really even X in? Not really. I mean, yeah. great actor, great comedic actor. He was great on, on Seinfeld. But come on. That was inappropriate. Very inappropriate. Yeah. So, Fortuitous. Yeah. So there there the the saying that anything goes really isn't true. There's some things that are just beyond the pale. You still have to have some some class and some tact. And, and, and sensitive to, you know, to, it's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. You're not. I know what you're saying. But, yeah. you, you know, the, the, the plight that this country has done to people of color, period, is a sensitive subject. And, 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 and the trans community and the gay community can say the same thing about their community. It, 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 I'm not of that community. And I salute that community for who they are. I, I have no issues with that community at all. And they can speak on their behalf. I'm speaking on, on the behalf of being black, African-American in this country. And, you know, I had somebody say that word to me after a show, and he got knocked out, too. That was in Houston, Texas, right? Yeah, yeah. he got knocked out for saying yeah. it to me. And a, it was a white comedian on the show who wanted to say the word because something happened to him, and I told him, not on my watch, bro. Yeah. You, you, can, you can try it out another weekend. But don't disrespect But you try this GT. weekend, you're going to get knocked out too. What's, what's the big project that's in the chamber right now? What do we more get? Fat Tuesday stuff. Uh, you're going to build up. Um, we're pitching build. More, more shows surrounded by the brand of Fat Tuesdays. Uh, people want more. People said the documentary wasn't enough. They wanted more. When they got through watching the three episodes, it was like, you know, what's happening? So we're in the process of putting... When I, when I originally pitched the project, I pitched like six shows related to the brand because people told me, you know, when I first started doing the doc, I start, first started working on the doc as far as like developing it on documentaries don't make money. So I created other shows under the umbrella. So like, okay, you do this, then you got first refusal to these other shows too. So you, you, you're, I mean, I'm looking at your Amazon page you're five star rated i mean it's it's just kicking ass that that show is is as so a lot of people were on the show and could you please everybody were some people yeah. left out man well let's and did you get some, <laughs> some people gave me my flowers some people gave me some dead roses to a lot of people who we didn't get to interview we didn't get to their story and i wanted to get to all of them and I did my due diligence in preparing the documentary as much as I can for the director to come in and tell the story how he saw fit, right? Because it's a legend in the game. And I, I, I did as much prep as I could. I interviewed people, pre-interviewed people. I had binders, five binders Dude. this thick. You saw the I binders. I saw them, man. It was binders full of, all, all full of the research. I did the work. And... For some people, their story just didn't fit the narrative. Right. Or there's also a lot of powers that be when you, when you bring in everything. You also have someone who's writing a check who have their list of people sure. that they want to see. Their affiliations, die. yeah. And 
and then you have your list of people, but then you have the people that you, you, he, you need to talk to, the staff. No, they're not big names, but you want to hear from them, you know? And a lot of comics, man, who are my friends, were upset that they weren't in it. And I tried to get them in it. And they just, and it's, it's crazy because they know the business. They've been in this game just as long as I have. Some have done their own projects. You know how the system works. You know how it goes. And they still, you know, narcissistic, as narcissists as they are, I mean, upset, mad. How come I, how come I didn't, how come, I can show you the binders where, I, and, and, and some I talked to, I interviewed for hours. Right. They in just, pre -interview. it's called hitting the cutting floor, it's right? A, it's a, well, they didn't even get to the, the, the film, but, you know, I'm not going to hire a director and then tell you how to direct. Right. I'm going to trust you, especially when you're as decorated as the director that we had. And it wasn't that he had any personal vendettas against these people. It's just the fact that we could only fit so much sure, down in the, the amount of time that we had. And then we had a lot of other restrictions. We, we shot during COVID. Right? I remember that was so a headache for So the budget you. went toward, you know, protecting the staff, protecting the set, protecting Compliance. The, the talent. A lot. We had a time limit, you know. And sometimes we had a great uh, crew that scheduled. Sometimes you didn't fit in that time slot in the period that we needed to tell this story. And we got to get it done. We can't shoot forever. Right. So, and there's a hierarchy. You know, if, if, if you're an A-list actor, comedian, singer, right, and you're a comedian who was part of the Fat Tuesday thing, and you're not even C-list, or you could be C-list, and you're telling the same story, Guess who's going get guess guess who they want? They want Sorry, the big dog. Yeah. But they want the big dog. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we want to get as many eyes on this project as possible. This A list gonna get more eyes than see that. As a as a as a actor comedian myself, I understand where I am on the hierarchy of things. If they call so and so over me, I get it. I man, I got several friends who are directors, producers, uh and I don't ask them to put me in anything. Right. Because I'm your friend because you're my friend, not because of what you can do for my career. And so many people in, in this town will befriend you because what they think you can do for them. All day and, long. And if, if, if the timing is right and the project is right and the stars are aligned and I'm a part of that project, great. But you never hear me go to a friend and right. say, hey, how come you didn't get mad at me for not putting me into one of your productions? Right, right. That's not why we're friends. Yeah. Well, maybe you'll get those guys in the in the in the run back, right? That's the other thing. This Fat Tuesday umbrella, this train moves on, and if I didn't get you here, you'll get. Damn sure I'm gonna get you down the line. Hundred percent. But people are, you know, sure. they they're so into them, they don't they don't see that, even though they've done their own shit. So, you know, and if we don't get you, then we don't get you. Can then God didn't want you in it. I prayed on everybody that's in that oh, documentary. I prayed for. I know There's some people who I wanted in it didn't do it. God didn't want them in it. So if God didn't want you in it, you, you go talk to God. Don't talk to me. Right. Miss me with that bullshit. I mean, Tiffany Haddish, Steve Harvey, Regina King. It goes on and on, man. It's just, I mean, guy, you and they're know, they're great in it. They're awesome. They're not in just it, in man. it. They're awesome. They're in great it. in it because they know you real well. That's the thing, and 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 you're very well known, very well liked in town, guy. You know, the the question that everyone asks is, when's that podcast coming out, man? Fat Tuesday podcast coming soon. Because there's a lot of stories we didn't get to in the documentary. There's a lot of people we didn't get to talk to in the documentary. And there's a book, and there's a documentary. And, and trust me, it's going to be way darker than the doc. Uh, yeah, we want Especially that. the book. Oh, Any, the book is going to be dark. What about merch? Gonna be... Are we going to see hoodies and stuff? Because oh, yeah, that's, yeah. the logo's yes. cool, man. It, yeah. No, it's... it's, it's, it's it's a franchise. Yeah. It's a brand. Even a cigar, maybe, or uh, who knows down the line. So I would, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm loving the whole branding. It's something that was a vision of yours. It helped a lot of people along the way. You continue to help people through charity. You have a big heart for homeless people, and you man, and I, the homies. Man, you and I seen the ravage uh, of high cost city like L.A. and what it turns the guys that are on that edge, man. We got to do something about mental illness in this in this in this uh, in this country, man, and that that contributes a lot to the homeless problem. Uh, a friend of mine who was attacked recently by 
um, a homeless person. That's why I'm, I'm torn because it's like, man, I, you know, when it was, you know, Kim Glass, uh, oh, man, uh, Kim. U.S. Olympian and a silver medalist in volleyball, got attacked, you know, just Kim, minding her own business up. by a homeless person. And it's like you want to go and grab this, you know, you know, and and there's no excuse. But if, if this country doesn't attack mental illness, our, it, there's a reason why, though. There's a reason why. Because in the last Bush administration, well, he, he canceled the mental illness budget for inner city because his buddies own private prisons. So there's always follow the money. And, follow and that's the why. money. But a lot of our veterans who serve this country uh, are, are homeless people that's down on Skid Row and in other cities uh, across America who fought for this country. And... Unfortunately, this country does not address mental illness. And you nailed it on the head. We interviewed um, LAPD Dion Joseph. He was worked Skid Row on foot for years. He said, we threw the baby out with the bathwater when we closed those mental facilities. I think the Reagan era, during Reagan's time, we closed that. Why well, don't Bush, Bush, Bush. Continued the, conti the yeah, policy. He, he, yeah. I, I wish Obama would have, you know, maybe Let's, reinstalled. And maybe he did, and I just don't know, but. But Let, the, the homeless situation is, is, is bad everywhere. Let's take politics out for a second. What if we built one last... <laughs> really? <laughs> That's hard. We're going to talk about uh, dust. Well, that, again, <laughs> politics, because there's a lot of old white men are in office. Right. Um, so we talk about dust, you talk about politics. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Watch this. We don't build one less aircraft carrier. No. And we could fund homeless... Shelters that actually serve as rehab centers well, and mental health professionals that don't zap well, people. Well, and, but here's you know the thing, what I mean? Though. Here's the thing with that. That's a, it's it's kind of tricky, and I, I'm I'm not entrenched in what goes on behind the scenes. So I'm, I'm sure you can talk to professionals who really know what's going on. But from the outside looking in and just talking to a lot of the homeless, the homies, uh, the homeless situation, our men and women on the streets, um, they don't want structure. There are facilities. Some of them don't want structure. They don't want to have to have a curfew. Right. They don't want to have to uh, be drug free. They don't want. They want to have sex. You know. They rather fuck on a corner than fuck. It, it, you know. They rather fuck on a corner than be in a nice warm bed with three hots and a cot. So it, it, it's 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 tricky because there there are facilities. So this, it's just finding a way how to treat the mental illness and work that way. Right. And, 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 and that because a lot of people, they, they just want, they don't want to be, they don't want responsibility. Right. There's a black guy I heard who's a physicist, uh, and his family been trying to get him off the streets for a while. He's like, nope, I'm good. And he's got an IQ of like a 165 yeah. or whatever. He's like yeah. Mensa, yeah. you yeah. know? Right. So it's, 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 but there's enough smart people to figure it out. Yeah. Unfortunately, you and I aren't those people. I'm not. <laughs> But yeah, guy, I, I just felt Jim. <laughs> right. Guy, you you uh you've done a lot for charity, man, for cancer, for for children, for for homeless. So I you know, hats off to you. You don't get your roses enough for man, that I stuff. I get my flowers uh, yeah. every every morning I wake up, those are my flowers. Nobody That's owes right. me shit. No one owes you shit and you earned everything you did, guy. And so hats off to you, man. Salute you. We love you, bro. And um you, can our fans tap in with you do you have like an instagram or facebook yeah. or uh i need to get my instagram up too so please follow me at guy tory g-u-y t-o-r-r-y my youtube page is coming it's there it's just okay. not there there it'll be there soon i have a lot of content i'm putting on there. that's guy tory too and facebook has locked me out for some reason i don't know why i can't <laughs> get into any of my accounts there's an old white man face on my <laughs> that mitt romney bit you did yeah, back. <laughs> yeah somebody got control of my account but i'll i'll work it out somehow Right on. And I'm, I'm, I'm starting to do the TikTok thing. I thought TikTok, I'm going to show my age now, I thought it was just for motherfuckers who dance, and I can't dance. But I, I, I see it's bigger than that. So That's right. just, you know, and my website, it will be up soon too, GuyToryLive.com or GuyTory.com. We're going to look for it. And if you haven't seen Fat Tuesdays, check that out on Amazon Shame Originals. On you. And rate it. When you watch it, rate, rate it. Rate it. Give it five stars, baby. Guy Tory, thank you again, brother. Love you.